and welcome to Flash Forward. I'm Rose, and I'm your host. Flash Forward is a show about the future. Every episode, we take on a specific possible or not so possible future scenario. We always start with a little field trip into the future to check out what's going on, and then we teleport back to today to talk to experts about how that world that we just heard might really go down. Got it? Great. Before we go to the future this episode, I want to do a tiny bit of business housekeeping stuff. This is episode 11 of this season, which means that we are halfway through the very arbitrary 20 episodes that make up each season of Flash Forward. So I wanted to pause and really quickly say a few things. First, thank you so much to all the patrons who make this show happen. Today's episode has zero ads sold on it, which means that without Patreon, I would be making exactly zero (laughs) dollars. Every episode takes me about 60 hours to make, so I can't exactly do that without knowing that I'll make at least a little bit of money. I do have a dog to feed, and you will hear from her later in this episode. So if you love Flash Forward, please consider donating on Patreon. Every dollar really does help, and patrons get all kinds of rewards, like behind-the-scene posts, a private newsletter, and even a big goodie bag full of stickers and pins, and an original short story by me. You can learn more about how to become a patron at patreon.com slash flashforwardpod or at flashforwardpod.com slash support. Okay, second thing, I am doing another survey. Longtime listeners of the show probably remember me doing this before, but that data is now old and I have to update it. So we have to keep everything accurate. This is a very scientific show, you know. So if you want to help out the show, go to flashforwardpod.com slash survey. If you have already filled out a survey, please fill this one out again. It really helps to get an accurate snapshot of the current listenership right now. And five people who fill out the survey will win a goodie bag. The survey is very short and the information is super helpful for me, not just to find better advertisers, but also to make the show better. So go to flashforwardpod.com slash survey and I will put a link at the top of the show notes too, and please, please fill out the survey. Thank you for doing that. Okay, let's go to the future. This episode, we're starting in the year 2042. Okay, just gotta put this collar thing on you. Okay, good girl, pistachio. Right, I think it's on. And then I guess I just use this app. And I guess I just talk to it. Hello, pistachio. Hello, Allegra. Oh my god! Please don't yell. Sorry, I just didn't think this would work. So, uh, do you want to go for a walk? Ah, yes, my daily allowance into the outside world. Sure. Would you prefer if I took you out more? Of course not. There are garbage trucks and people with beards out there. Okay, while we're chatting, I have another question. Why do you bark so much? Well, first of all, until about an hour ago, you couldn't understand me. Do you know how frustrating that is to have the person you spend 99% of your time with be not only completely unable to figure out what you were trying to say, but also annoyed that you are trying to communicate with them at all? It could drive anybody to drink, really. Also, there could be a murderer at the door at any moment, and you seem completely unconcerned. Okay. But as to your earlier question regarding a walk, yes, I would like to go outside now. I have to pee. Oh, okay, right. Let me get your leash. Renee, I swear to God this thing works. I was going to talk about it as a segment on Stupid Dog Tech for this week's episode, but it is not stupid. It actually works. Lex, this is not a funny prank to play on me. You know that I'm getting my hopes up. I swear to God. Here, I brought it. Let's put it on Tug. Okay. All right, Tugboat, come here. Yep, yep. Okay, just on the table. Sure, why not? Okay, hold him still and I'll put it on. What a good boy. Are we on the table, Tug? Okay, now here's the app. Just push that button and talk. Hi, Tugboat. Good morning. Hello. I am so glad to see you. Oh my god. I know. I know. No, seriously, what? I love you. How is this possible? Because you are great. Right, it's kind of freaking me out. I don't know if I like it. And it worked on Pistachio too. Yeah. What did she say? She was kind of mean, actually. <laughs> Isn't it cool that I can jump on the table in one leap? 
Actually, Tuck, now that we can chat, you really can't jump on the table like this anymore. Why not? It's just, it's not good behavior. I love you. Oh, yeah. I don't like this. Yeah, I think I preferred when we just guessed what they were thinking. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, let's take it off. Wait, Tug, can I ask you a question first? Of course! When you run around with that scuttlebutt thing, like you're some kind of possessed demon, why? Like, what are you doing? Well, there are just so many smells in this house that sometimes I feel like I can't take them in properly without getting some velocity. Also, it seems to make Renee happy. She always laughs. And she seems so sad sometimes about some person named Robert. I do not like Robert. Okay, yeah, let's definitely take this off. Okay, so this episode is about talking to animals. Animals talking to us and us being able to understand them. Like in the book or the movie, Dr. Doolittle. Or maybe a more refined example is the Ursula K. Le Guin short story called The Author of the Acacia Seeds, which I had actually never read until working on this episode, but Monica Byrne, who you heard on the Federal Project 2 episode, recommended it, and it is such a delight. So today is all about animal language, human language, and whether we could ever bridge the gap between them. Now, I had no idea until I started researching this subject, but the idea that animals might have language is actually a hotly debated subject in the field. Pretty much everybody agrees that animals communicate with one another, whether that's out loud or with pheromones or body language or color changes or whatever. But saying that animals have language is actually really controversial. And that's in part because proving that something has language is really hard to do. Let's start with uh, this conversation that you and I are having. Let's say that uh, you have an alien PhD student who tells his major professor that he thinks that humans have language. And the major professor, she scowls and says, no, uh, clearly humans don't have language, but go ahead and prove it to me. So he takes his electron telescope from his spaceship out by the moon and focuses on me. And he has another telescope that is focused on you. And so as I'm talking to you, I may be waving my hands around a little bit. I don't know what you're doing, but maybe you're waving your hands around too when you you talk to me. And so he can record the pattern of our vocalizations And he can also videotape what the hands are doing. And he tries to correlate all of that. And nothing emerges from this. The uh, hand wavings seem to be entirely random. He can't really pick out a pattern in the vocalizations that he can come up with. And he finally concludes that um, humans don't have any language, that essentially The hand wavings are just expressions of emotionality based on some sort of instinctive program of excitability rather than actual language. And so he goes back to his major professor and she says, see, I told you, humans don't have language. Go and do something productive that will actually give you some results. And that's pretty much where we are right now with a lot of animals. I'm Kon Slobachikov. I'm Professor Emeritus of Biology at Northern Arizona University, also CEO of Zulingua, and uh, I study animal languages. Khan is also the author of a book called Chasing Dr. Doolittle, and Khan believes that animals do have language. We just don't know how to translate it. But not everybody agrees, and it kind of depends on how you define language, right? Is language simply using symbols to refer to objects? Or does language require something more? Do you have to have verbs or phrases or the ability to demonstrate complex cognitive processing? And there are important reasons to be cautious with claims around animal language, especially when it comes to animals that we are training to answer questions or to communicate with us in human-like ways. How can we be sure that these animals actually understand the words or concepts that they're saying? instead of just mimicking or even responding to subtle cues from us. The classic example of this comes from the 1400s in Germany and a horse named Clever Hans. Uh, Clever Hans was a horse who could apparently do arithmetic. You give it a number like two plus four and Hans would have stomped his hoof six times. 
to give you the answer. And people were amazed by that until uh, one zoologist discovered that what Hans was responding to was not the actual question that he was given, but how people leaned backwards slightly when the right answer was uh, being produced. So Hans didn't really have a concept of what the right answer was. Hans had a concept of what the people were actually doing. This has come to be known in the animal communication field as the clever Hans phenomenon. Skeptics of some of this uh, work of teaching animals uh, language have said, well, part of it might be a clever Hans phenomenon in the sense that the experimenters are influencing the outcome. Even some of the most famous experiments in animal language have since been discounted as clever Hans tricks. In the 1970s, a psychologist at Columbia named Herbert Terrace took in a chimpanzee, and he named it Nim Chimsky, I swear to God. And Nim lived with Terrace and his wife, Stephanie Lafarge, and their daughter, Jenny, in their Upper West Side house. Terrace taught Nim all kinds of sign language, all told 125 different signs. But when Terrace reviewed some of the videos of Nim signing with a teacher, he started to have second thoughts. Here is Terrace talking to NPR about the experiment. Nim was tracking most of the teacher signs, imitating most of the teacher signs. He almost never uh, made a sign spontaneously. Terrace came to believe that Nim would never use language the way humans do to form sentences and express ideas. That was the end of the project. But not all ape studies of language ended like this. Before Nim, there was Washoe, a female chimpanzee born in 1965 who researchers again taught sign language. Washoe ultimately learned over 350 signs. And unlike Nim, whose handlers were convinced that he was just mimicking them, Washoe's handlers thought that she was able to remember and recombine signs long after learning them. There's even a story about Washoe that she learned the sign for quiet and she would sign it to herself in situations when she was doing something that she knew she might get in trouble for. Or some of you might be familiar with Coco the Gorilla. Here's a clip from a documentary called A Conversation with Coco, and you will hear Coco's handler, Penny Patterson, asking Coco questions. And Coco responds using sign language. Who is that? Think me there. Okay, that is you. Gorilla, animal, Coco love. Okay, that's very good. That is you. You are a lovely animal. Like Washoe, Coco's sign language seemed to rise above simple mimicry. She could ask for things and start conversations. Over her life, Coco learned over a thousand signs and became an international celebrity. As a kid, I had this book called Coco's Kitten, which was all about how Coco adopted a kitten and cared for it. Coco died in June of this year, and it was a really sad day for a lot of people. Her death also was the impetus for a lot of pieces written by scientists arguing that Coco didn't learn language. I will quote just one of them by Dr. Patricia Goh, a psychologist at Maynooth University. She wrote, quote, In spite of reporting to the contrary, Coco did not master sign language. She then goes on to say that Coco was like all of the other primates that have been taught sign language. She writes, quote, Many of the primates did not use language spontaneously. Even in examples where they did, they used it simply to acquire something, such as food or a hug. This is in contrast with human children who, although they use language to request things, also talk or sign simply to interact, to be social, and to alert someone of something interesting. Go ends the piece saying, quote, It is now generally accepted that apes and other non-human primates cannot acquire language and that the major stumbling block is structural complexity. Now, I am not an expert here, so who am I really to say whether animals do or don't have language? But I will say that personally, having at this point fallen way down into the rabbit hole and read a lot of papers from the last 40 years about animal language, it does feel a bit like scientists are continually tweaking the definition of what language is in order to make sure that non-human animals don't have it. Either way, it's probably not that surprising to you that a chimpanzee or a gorilla could learn sign language, right? I mean, they are so close to humans. And 
we're pretty sure that humans have language, right? But there's another famous example of training an animal to speak to humans using human language that involves a species that we don't really think of as being all that smart. When I put in my first grant proposal, it literally came back asking me what I was smoking. But this was something that I felt was really possible and made sense. This is Irene Pepperberg. She works at Harvard in the psychology department, and she's most famous for working with this bird. How many key? Two. You're right. What's different? What's different? Color. That's right. And what color bigger? What color bigger? Good birdie. Oh, you're such a good boy. Yes, you can have lots of nuts for that. Here. Well, we went to a bunch of pet stores trying to find birds that were had not been wild caught. We finally found a pet store in the Chicago area. The birds were really healthy. Um, they were all in a big cage, playing around with one another. So I asked the fellow to pick a bird for me because I didn't want anybody to say that there was anything special about the bird that I had chosen. And he took out a big butterfly net and he scooped up a bird. And that turned out to be Alex. Alex was an African gray parrot. Where did the name Alex come from? Avian learning experiment. So Irene took Alex back to the lab, and she started trying to teach him human words. I had him for about two weeks, and we found that you know, the thing he liked the best was to chew on paper. So I said, okay, that's the first label I'm going to try teaching him. And after two weeks, he said something like, eh, eh. and it was like, oh my gosh, He's got the acoustic envelope here. And so I had a really good feeling that this was going to work. It turns out that paper is a really hard word for a parrot to say because they don't have lips. Okay, mouth the word paper right now, and you'll notice that you use your lips to make that p p sound. Parrots cannot do that. But the fact that he could mimic some kind of sound that was really close to paper suggested to Irene that she was on to something. With Alex, Irene came up with a method of teaching him language that she called the model rival method. So the way that this works is that you have Alex, the bird, you have a trainer, and then you have a rival for the trainer's attention, usually played by a student. And we use objects that the birds want, so there's inherent interest in the object itself, so we can use that object as a reward. So that might be a key, for example. Alex really liked keys. So the bird is sitting on a perch. It's seeing this object it really wants. I show that to a student, and I say, what's here? She says, key, and I say, that's right, it's a key, and I give it to her, and she goes, key, and she's scratching herself the way the bird would use the key to scratch itself. And she's going, key, 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 I'm going, that's right, that's right. Then the rival and the trainer switch roles. So she shows it to me and says, what's this? And I go, eh, and she turns away and she says, no, that's wrong. The idea here is to show Alex that it's not just any random set of sounds that get him the key, the reward. He has to actually say key to get the key. And then we let the bird try. Using this method of model rival, Irene was able to train Alex to say over a hundred words. But the impressive thing about Alex wasn't that he memorized a lot of words in connection with images. Instead, it was that he could generalize. If you showed him different keys made of metal or plastic, big and small, he recognized that they were all still key-shaped. And he could pick out which objects in a set were different from one another and how they were different. So he understood which attributes were same or different, and that an object could be same with respect to some things and different with respect to other things. And that's a much higher level of understanding than just the typical identity versus non-identity. So earlier you heard a clip of Alex saying which key was bigger, which one was green, that kind of thing. Here is another example. This is a clip from a Nova documentary about Alex, and in this clip, you can hear Alex differentiating between a few different things. Irene is showing Alex two keys. One is metal and smaller, and the other one is yellow and plastic and a little bit bigger. Can you tell me what's different? Color. All right. Can you tell me what's same? Shape. Good boy. What color bigger? You know, what color bigger? Good boy! Good birdie! Alex would even recombine words. We were trying to teach Alex the word apple, and he comes up with binary, 
banana cherry. And, you know, you look at him and you go, okay, it kind of looks like a big cherry. It tastes a little bit like a banana. Mm, All right. And the B seems obviously easier for you to say than another P sound. So we'll go with it. In another case, someone brought a cake into the lab. Alex knew the word for bread, and he knew the word yummy, and when he tasted the cake, he said, yummy bread. But like with Coco, Irene has faced a ton of skepticism about just how much her work really says about language and a bird's ability to communicate. When I would give my talks in the you know, late 70s, early 80s, the argument was, well, but there's no cerebral cortex. How can they do it? And I'd say, well, go find it. You know, these are my data. <laughs> the bird can do this. Today, researchers who study birds know that while they might have tiny, nut-sized brains, they actually do have structures within those brains that can act like our cerebral cortex and that might be involved in something that looks like language. So it's taken a very long time for people to truly understand why these birds can do what they're doing. Alex died unexpectedly in 2007 at age 31. If you want to read more about him, you can read Irene's book, Alex and Me, which is all about their relationship and research. And today, Irene is still working with birds, studying what might be going on in their heads. When I started, avian cognition in particular was an oxymoron. People just could not believe that a bird could do these kinds of things that were challenging to young children and to apes. But today, if you look for people doing the kind of work that Irene was doing with Alex you will probably have a hard time finding it. There's nobody really concentrating on the language communication aspect right now. In fact, even Irene isn't doing this work anymore. She's shifted her research to teaching the birds enough language skills so that she can study their cognition. But she's not doing animal-human communication anymore. Today, the people who do study animal communication and animal language mostly aren't trying to teach non-human animals to communicate with us using our forms of language, like sign language. And that might be a good thing. A lot of people have questioned whether teaching animals human communication forms is really the best way to figure out if non-human animals can and do have language. By this metric, dolphins and apes probably think that we don't have language, since they've never managed to teach us to talk to them using their ways of communication, right? I think that where our future lies in terms of understanding animal languages is decoding the language abilities of wild animals where you don't have this uh, problem of training them. So let's look at some of those examples. Most of Khan's work happens in a species that, like birds, many people don't think of as being super smart. Initially, I started looking at prairie dogs because I was interested in social behavior. And uh, they had a social system that wasn't very well known at that time. And I thought that I could do some work describing how the social system functioned. But as Khan was studying these prairie dogs and their social interactions, he started noticing something about their calls. Everybody knew that they had alarm calls, but everybody assumed that they had only one alarm call for every situation. We see a snake and we go, eek. We see a lion and we go, eek. And the eek is always the same. But Khan didn't think this was true. And when he listened closer, he was certain that different alarm calls were actually different. And he was right. Khan's work has found that prairie dogs have a ton of different calls. They can encode all kinds of information in their warning calls. In his early experiments, Khan figured out that prairie dogs can tell each other what kind of predator they should be looking for. So we identified a call for humans, another one for coyotes, another one for red-tailed hawks, another one for domestic dogs. But even still, Khan noticed that within those groups of warning signs for humans and dogs and hawks and coyotes, not all of the calls sounded exactly the same. Maybe they're describing the physical properties of each individual predator. So we set up some experiments to test for that and found, indeed, over a series of experiments that they do describe the physical properties of an individual predator. So, for example, for a human, they can describe the size and shape of the human. They can describe the color of clothes that humans are wearing. They can describe something about the speed of travel. 
Yeah, so the prairie dogs can be like, hey guys, there's a tall, skinny human wearing a blue shirt coming. Watch out. And it gets even more impressive. And in one experiment that we did with black-tailed prairie dogs, they even were able to put on an addendum to a human that that human carried a gun and then apparently remembered for the length of the experiments that that human had a gun even when he showed up without a gun. They always added on that gun addendum. In other experiments, Kahn showed that, like Alex the parrot, prairie dogs can recognize and describe different shapes, like ovals and circles. We essentially satisfied all of the criteria that uh, linguists have said are necessary to show that an animal has language. And Kahn was really surprised by this. I never really expected that something that is a rodent, uh, who essentially weighs about a pound, would actually have that kind of sophistication. And this got Khan thinking, if prairie dogs can do this, what can other animals do? Which is what led him to writing his book, Chasing Dr. Doolittle, documenting all the various ways that animals can communicate at a level that he considers language. Take, for example, lizards. They have a a set way of bobbing their head. They can lift up uh, their arms, they can lift up their legs, they can lift up their tail in uh, specific patterns that fit the rules of grammar. So what does he mean by grammar here? Basically, if these displays were combined randomly, if there was no rhyme or reason here and they could just be used at any time and in any order, there would be 6,864 possible combinations. But in the wild, you don't see 6,864 combinations you actually only see 172 of them, which means that there are rules about which ones can go in which order, which is grammar. We typically don't think of lizards as having grammar. Uh, We typically don't think of lizards as communicating very much at all, and yet here they are having this very sophisticated kind of communication system that follows set rules. So that's one of the favorites of mine. Like I said, this idea that what we're talking about here rises to the level of language is controversial. In fact, at the beginning of Khan's book, he actually has a disclaimer saying that these are just his interpretations of the studies that he talks about. A lot of the researchers whose work he includes in the book probably would not say that what they have shown is language in these species. These lizards or squid aren't talking to one another the way you or I use our mouth holes to make sounds. But they are communicating, for sure. We humans are so plugged into the idea that language is uh, something that's on the auditory channel. You know, we speak, uh, we hear, and so language has to be spoken, it has to be auditory. But there are a variety of different languages that animals use. Other animals might use visual signals. Other animals might use uh, smell, for example. The smell of objects in the vicinity, the smell of things that are up ahead, the smells of things that are no longer there, but, you know, who've left their odor behind, that creates, um, that creates their world. I'm Alexandra Horowitz. I study dog behavior and cognition, and I run a dog cognition lab at Barnard College. Alexandra's work tries to figure out how dogs perceive and process the world. And for dogs, one of their main channels of information is smell. In fact, dogs are incredibly good at smelling things. You probably already know this, but here are some examples that will never cease to impress me. Dogs can find drowned people by sniffing the water. They can find people buried in under 24 feet of snow. And this is the one that is always the most impressive to me. One study found that bloodhounds could identify who touched a pipe bomb after the bomb had exploded. That's incredible. Most dog-dog communication is going to include a strong olfactory component. And we're not doing any of that. We're really not kind of listening to what they smell like, right? It's, It's imponderable to us. And this presents us with a challenge, right? We have this species that communicates on a totally different channel than we do, which makes it even harder to get into their heads and understand them. That's a tough way to start because I can't then tell you what it's like to be a smelling creature. You know, I don't know what a smelling creature thinks about. 
Alexandra is trying to figure out how to bridge this kind of gap between a smelling dog and a talking human. And she did so by smelling stuff, like her friends. When I was doing research for my book on dogs uh, smelling, I wanted to improve my own sense of smell. And part of that was really smelling a lot of things. And I admitted to my friends that I had smelled them all. You know, like I, if I'm hugging my friend, I'll, I'll give them a nice whiff. And it's, it was like, it's a sort of a tense moment there. I don't even think people wanted to think that they had a smell that they might be giving off, um, whether it was a smell they'd added or just the natural smell of themselves, let alone that somebody had taken it in. I am definitely going to do this. So friends, watch out. I am going to sniff you. Oh, I, I, I recommend it. And I think you get information from them. I mean, you might get information that one of your friends is sick, for instance, with a lot of illnesses have an odor. Um, and she is probably not intending to send that off, but she's, you know, that information is being conveyed nonetheless. That is a kind of communication. But even with this experiment, Alexandra is hesitant to say that she knows what a dog is thinking or what a dog might say if we had a way to better understand them. I think it would be presumptuous of me to, to even say I have a sense that it wouldn't be narrative in the way that we communicate, right? Where we're telling stories and we're formulating sentences into paragraphs and, and we're also ruminative and we kind of reflect on things that have happened. I have, I have a feeling it wouldn't be quite like that, but I, I, I don't think it's right for me to, to suggest. But we can't resist suggesting, can we? If you have a dog, or really any pet, you have probably found yourself imagining what that animal is thinking, or what they would say. You've probably talked to your pet as if it was a regular conversation, and I bet some of you have responded in the voice of your pet. This is a totally normal thing to do. Or maybe I am just saying that because it is totally something that I do with my dog, Moro. And in fact, I know that this is something that some of you do because I asked for you all to send in clips of yourselves having conversations with your pets, and you did. The clips that you sent are so funny. I love them. So here is Kristen's husband, Ryan, talking to their cat, Olaf. Olaf, do you mind if I record a little bit of our conversation? No, I don't know, you know. Just, just a little bit, just... Uh... There's some people who want to hear how we talk to each other. Oh, do we talk to each other? Yeah, just like this. So we talk to each other back and forth. Oh, I don't know if that's the case or not. Yeah, it's, it's the case. I talk to you and then you talk back. We have little conversations. Oh, I don't know about that. It's true. It's true. Here's Dave talking to his dog, Hunter. Uh, Hunter's just like, sitting on the floor looking up at me hey uh um can i can i have can i have that 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 thing that you're doing right there uh, buddy this is too hot it's gonna burn your mouth no no it's okay i'll eat it real quick like this i won't even taste it i promise i will not burn my mouth hunter come on dude no just you can't have this but but i will eat it so much it will be gone and you will not know it and i will love it and i will be happy please 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 no, you can't. This is people food. Stop. No, go away. Go play. Fine. I will go find the little one. So Hunter trots off to, to my youngest daughter and uh, says, excuse me, little one, that food that you are having, I will have it now too. Where she promptly tells him, no, you can't have this. This is mine. But then he sits down and he gives her the puppy dog eyes. And she she looks at me and she says, daddy, I did not. Just give Hunter all of my food. Meanwhile, Hunter on the floor. Nom, 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 nom. I did not just eat all of that food. And it's not just dogs and cats either. Here is an incredible clip of Michelle's daughter talking to their guinea pigs. Are you guys in the dark? Yes, you are in the dark. Do you like it in the dark? Yeah, we like it in the dark. We didn't get our carrots today. I'll give you some this evening. Michelle says I get bit in the walk by my brother. I do. I'm also kind of shy, but kind of outgoing at the same time. 
I'm very nice and I don't bite anymore. I only I only give kisses. <laughs> I we both have very big testicles. <laughs> that was the guinea pig interview. You can pause it now. Whew, nine year olds. But Alexandra wonders if we really actually want to have these conversations for real with our pets. I really listen to what owners say when they talk to their dogs. And I've been taking notes on that for years. And we have all these different types of things that we say to dogs was, was we're with them and walking them. And those are fascinating. But I, I don't think that we want the dog to talk back there. I think that it's the dog's quietness that appeals to us that we're kind of, they're, they're a little bit, the conversation's a little bit of figment of our imagination. And if they talked back, I can't even imagine how that would be satisfying. And when we come back, we're going to get into this question. What would it actually be like if we could really speak to and understand animals? How would it change our relationships with them? Would we respect them more or less? All that and more after this quick break. Okay, so let's set aside the practicality now. Forget whether animals have language and, if so, how we might build a decoder ring to understand it. Let's talk about what animals might say to us in this magical Dr. Doolittle world. What would they talk about? Well, maybe technology. So technology has become a way that you can perhaps investigate uh, what other species know without having to um, uh, train a gorilla to use sign language. (laughs) If it's controversial to say that animals have language, it is even more controversial to say that they have technology. But that is exactly what Ashley Shu argues in her new book called Animal Constructions and Technical Knowledge. We think that human beings are so closely related to the things that we carry around, make, do. The, these are the things that, that show that show that we're smarter than animals. And I, I think that's, you know, that's bull in some ways, uh, just to refer to animals again. Let's just pause and appreciate that pun. Okay, so Ashley's book is all about the ways that animals make things and whether or not those things rise to the level of technology. And she goes through several examples of what she argues could be considered technology in animals. She starts with primates. Researchers have documented chimpanzees using sticks to harvest ants out of their nests. Ant dipping is like sticking uh, a probe, a stick probe, into a termite or ant nest, having ants and things crawl up it, and then like licking all those ants off, having a protein snack. Um, I I think I call it an ansicle in my book. But not everybody believes that this tool use is really technology. So sometimes people say... You know, well, those animal cases, they use tools, but they're only using one tool at a time. So it doesn't show the sophistication of tool use that we expect technologies to have. So they're nowhere near technological and and humans are just technological and uh, chimpanzees can't be. So that's a particular narrative. But these antsicle creating chimps, they actually have an answer for that. I mean, they have no idea that they're answering a question here, but here's what they do. So if you ant dip enough, the ants or termites will move. They'll leave their nest. So one group of chimps figured out a way to harvest these ants without freaking them out too much. There's this one group that will cut open a nest with one type of stick tool, flip it over, ant dip where everything's really great and get a whole bunch of very successful ant dipping, then flip the nest back so it involves two tools, one to cut open and flip and then another one for dipping. And they can flip the nest cover back on Uh, which means that it'll take longer for the ants to leave. But again, you might be thinking, okay, sure, but those are chimps. They're basically like us. So let's talk about another species. Let's go back to birds and talk about crows. Fun fact about me, I am scared of birds. I really, really don't like birds. They terrify you because you don't want them to be as smart as you are. I have always told myself it's because they look like terrible little dinosaurs, but maybe Ashley's right. 
There are probably birds out there that are smarter than I am. Um, don't tell my tenure committee that. New Caledonian crows have different tools for different purposes depending on what they're seeking out and what they want to do. Um, still, actually, if a tool is particularly good, they've been known to come back and get that tool that they had been using before um, and, and, and um, use it for, for the same sort of test. When they're put in captivity and tests are done um, on captivity about sort of what materials they'll use, they can be given completely novel materials, materials they haven't seen before, and fashion them in ways to solve particular tasks. So most of these experiments basically present these new Caledonian crows with essentially puzzles. There's usually some kind of tube with a food object in it, and that tube is hard to get or you have to do something to unlock it to get at the food. These new Caledonian crows are super good surprising all the researchers. Multiple types of tools can fashion new tools out of novel materials that they have very little practice with. Researchers singled out new Caledonian crows for these experiments because they had observed them making tools in the wild. So they had an idea that, unlike many other birds, these crows were tool makers. So someone had had the great idea of testing rooks uh, with the same apparatus that they were testing the new Caledonian crows. Rooks are in the same family as crows and ravens, but they're a little bit smaller, and they mostly eat earthworms and insect larvae. Rooks don't make tools in the wild. You don't know them to make tools in the wild. And it turned out that the rooks could do a lot of the tasks that the New Caledonian crows could do. So these birds that nobody had ever seen make a tool in the wild could figure out how to make tools if they had to. A rook doesn't need to use a tool in the wild, even though it's completely capable of fashioning one in captivity when there's a treat in a tube situation um, happening. You know, it's sort of remarkable, right? Because we think about tool use and technology as, as special, special to us, and that we can figure out things better than other animals can. And in fact, relying on tools might not be evolutionarily beneficial to many animals. For the large majority of animals, carrying something extra around or having to go back and get that thing uh, reduces sort of survival advantage, actually diminishes your ability not to get caught by a predator. So you might be thinking, what does animal technology and tool use have to do with this future where we can talk to animals? Well, I think it actually has everything to do with it. To figure out what communicating with animals might be like, We need to understand what's going on in animals' heads, right? How do they process information and make decisions? How smart are they, really? All of that will dictate what our communication with them is like. And all of this research suggests that non-human animals might actually be a lot smarter and more complicated than we give them credit for. If we could understand them, they might have a lot to say or even to teach us. And taken one step further, if we could only hear what they were trying to say, the reasoning goes, maybe we wouldn't behave the way that we do now. Even imagining an animal being able to talk can really disrupt some of the assumptions we hold about them. And so when we start thinking about the imaginative potential to think about new ways of relating to animals, this can be a very powerful tool as well. So this, this idea of imagination, um, imagining a different future, imagining different conversations or relationships with other animals, um, there's a lot of important potential there. And I'm Dr. Carrie Cronin. I'm Associate Professor of History of Art and Visual Culture at Brock University, which is in uh, Canada, right near Niagara Falls. You thought I would get through a whole episode of this show without talking about history, did you? Haha, you were wrong. I can't resist. So I called Carrie because she wrote this really interesting article that she's turning into a book about the ways in which animals talking has been used by animal welfare activists throughout history. So take, for example, this engraving called Can't You Talk? It was published in an animal welfare journal in 1878. And in this uh, engraving, there's a small child sort of down on all fours looking face to face with a dog. And Two animals sort of lock gaze, the child and the dog, and the caption underneath says, can't you talk? And the viewer is sort of left to wonder whether the dog is asking the child or the child's asking the dog. And it's such an interesting image because it really raises questions about um, sort of the similarities between species. And of course, these things were being discussed in the 19th century with people like Charles Darwin writing um, about some of the similarities across species boundaries. This engraving was published in a lot of places, but most notably, it was published in a journal called Our Dumb Animals, which was put out by the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. 
And that journal name might seem, well, rude, but they didn't mean dumb as in not smart. They meant dumb as in couldn't talk, which, to be very clear, is a very ableist and terrible way of using that word. But that is what they meant. Animals can't talk, so therefore we as activists need to be their voice. So um, the MSPCA using that framework with their journal called Our Dumb Animals. So since animals couldn't talk, these publications imagined voices for them as a rhetorical tool. One of my favorite examples that Carrie gives in her work is this illustration of a horse. It's um, by the artist Harrison Weir, who um, was well known for a lot of his animal illustrations in the 19th century. And it's a picture of a very emaciated looking horse. You can see his ribs kind of sticking out and he looks very scruffy and, you know, that he's not really been living a particularly good life. And this is sort of echoed in the surroundings um, so that he's Uh, against a building that has sort of cracked stone. You can see bits of stone on the ground. So all of this is to emphasize sort of the the horse's physical condition. But in this particular scene that Harrison Weir has described visually for us, um, the horse is tugging at um, what looks like a a vine, but when you look closer, it's a a bit of a, a rope, tugging at it with his teeth. And this image goes along with this totally delightful story from an epic poem called The Bell of Atri by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Being an epic poem, it is pretty long, but it basically goes like this. Once upon a time, in a faraway place, a long, long time ago, there was a society who had this kind of unique approach to justice. And the approach was that if any member of that society had felt that he or she had been wronged, they would go to the town square and they would ring a bell. And then all of the townspeople would come out and there would be this sort of collective sense of justice on how this matter would be resolved. So... In this community, there was a knight who had this favorite horse, and then the horse got old, and the knight sort of turned the horse loose, didn't want to care for him anymore. He was no longer of use to the knight, so he sent the horse to kind of be out on its own. Um, and, and of course, the horse you know, struggled, couldn't find food, you know, and eventually sort of wandered into the town square, and as he was sort of nibbling around at vines and stuff trying to find something to eat, he ended up pulling on the rope of the bell, ringing the bell, and calling the townspeople out to the center of town. And when people saw this emaciated, suffering horse, they immediately got really angry. And so there was a, you know, one of these town meetings in which it was decided that the knight had to take care of this horse that had once been a faith- faithful companion. This story was super popular among animal activists in the 19th century. It was reproduced as a leaflet and passed out to people, and it became this metaphor for the ways that animals are trying to tell us something. But since they don't have the words that we use, we have to pick up the baton and advocate for them. Then, in the early 1900s, you saw ads against the vivisection of animals, which is basically the practice of live dissection. And these ads would show famously brave dogs begging for mercy. And so there's this tension or this dichotomy between these sort of loyal, brave dogs that would do anything for humans versus humans who are just callously cutting them open for our own benefit. In these ads, the dogs would be speaking and you'd see them quoted as saying, Save me, I would save you, what the dog is saying to us, I think is so significant because it really brings home in a very visceral or emotional way this complex dialogue of vivisection. It just boils all that away to this kind of gut punch. This dog is begging you, telling you that if your child was in trouble, that the, the dog would jump in and help. But what are you doing for her or for her puppies, that kind of thing? The act of imagining what animals might be saying if we could only understand remains a powerful tool in animal activism today. But if we could really understand animals, animal activists would have to change their tactics. I mean, think of that classic Sarah McLaughlin ad for the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Imagine what that would sound like if the dog sitting next to her in the ad could talk. Carrie also thinks that if we could talk to our pets, we might not like what they have to say. We like to think that they're talking about treats or that they want more toys, but maybe they're telling us that they're bored, that they don't really like living in the homes with us. What kind of implications does that have for us then in terms of our companion animals? And that's just pets. Being able to understand animals would probably have a huge impact on how many of us are willing to eat meat. Can you imagine taking this device into a huge slaughterhouse? It sort of reminds me of that moment in the show The Good Place, and this isn't really a spoiler, I don't think, where they decide they have to reset Janet, who is this sort of helper entity. 
She's not alive, you can't kill her, but she is programmed with a safety protocol that any time you get near her reset button, she begs for her life. So who's doing this, me or you? Uh, well, I, I, I think I have to. Um, being a bystander seems worse somehow. <sighs> okay, here we go. human. I can't die. I am simply an anthropomorphized vessel of knowledge built to make your life easier. Your pleading seems so real. Oh yes, it is a very effective failsafe. Ugh. You want a robot killed, right? You have to do it yourself. Eleanor? Eleanor, no, 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 please, wait, wait, wait. Eleanor, I have kids. I have three beautiful children. Tyler, Emma, and little tiny baby Philip. Look at Tyler. Tyler has asthma, but he is battling it like a champ. Look at him. No, Eleanor, look at them. Look at them! Oh, no, no, no. It's so realistic! Eleanor, again, I'm not human. This is a stock photo of the crowd at the Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards. So, like that, but Janet is a cow, or a pig, or a chicken, or something. And Ashley actually has an experience sort of like this on a smaller scale. You can't see out my window right now, but I live in an area where we get to watch cows. And there's a time of year when the cows make a lot of noise. And I had a friend over once who's an old farm kid, but he's an adult now. And we were sitting and we were, you know, talking about academic things. And I was like, the cows are just making so much noise. They must be having a good day today. And he's like, oh, you know why the cows are making so much noise? It's the time of year where they take their babies away. Oh, no. So, so all of a sudden, this time of year that I thought of as the great time when all these cows make noise and I really like it, it turned out to be it's all the moms are super sad because their babies are taken away cow time. So I imagine um, if cows could talk, um, it would change a lot of our farming practices. And since this technology would likely put a pretty big dent in the meat-eating population, Kerry thinks that the farm lobby would probably try to minimize its use and discredit it as much as possible. I, I would say almost certainly that they would um, put every legal injunction possible um, in the way of this technology existing. If we just look at what um, you know, Big Ag is doing in terms of... of um, activist campaigns using, you know, photography, video footage, that sort of thing. They're taking what once was, um, you know, a very minor charge, trespassing, if you, you know, went on a farm and took a picture of, you know, an animal being mistreated. At, at worst, you're, you're essentially trespassing, and they're turning this into, you know, felonies in many jurisdictions, um, you know, preventing people from sort of whistleblowing cruelty to animals. Ashley thinks that many people would simply argue that the device is fake, that it's all a lie. Even if they could talk, I think the first, the first wave would be not to believe anything they say. Now, I don't think that this is going to turn every single person into a vegetarian. My guess, if I had to guess, and that's literally what I do on this show every episode, is that if this device existed, the meat industry would change the way they handle slaughtering animals. They would figure out a way to put the animals into a sleep before they killed them so that there is no end-of-life begging or pleading. But this device will really force us to reconsider how we treat animals, not just for food or in our homes, but in other settings too. Imagine having this little box and walking through the forest or walking through a bad zoo. I think one thing we'd have to really think about if we could understand and talk to animals is making sure that we don't penalize them if they don't talk like us or think about the things that we think about. If the words from the animal that wind up coming out of this device don't follow exactly our grammar, or if they say things that are totally inscrutable to us, that doesn't mean that they're stupid or can't communicate. And it would be easy for us to assume that, because humans are an incredibly egotistical animal. There's this really great, and I'm going to refer to an Onion article now, um, there's this really great <laughs> art article from The Onion, and it's great because it's perfect. Um, and this, it says... Study dolphins not so intelligent on land. And it has like a sad picture of a dolphin like laying by a cone, and it talks about the test that the scientists laid out, which is like getting a dolphin to navigate cones in a parking lot, and um, you, you know, and, and all they could let out was like uh, labored wheezing, right? Like, 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 like we were going to put them through these tests that humans are really good at um, to find out if dolphins are intelligent or not, um, and you put them through human tests that humans are good at, and of course you're going to get the wrong results. That's it. 
it. That's the, what we're doing over and over again with all of these, uh, the way in which we're setting up studies, we're doing them with human biases already intact. So if we plug this device in and we get something that seems like gibberish out of animals, that might simply mean that we're not smart enough to understand what they're saying. Isn't that right, Moro? How smart are dogs? The smartest? The smartest and the best? Humans are idiots. I try to talk to you, and you don't listen. Okay, thank you. Bye. Go on, break. Good job. Let's go pee. That's all for this future. Flash Forward is produced by me, Rose Evelyn. The intro music is by Asura, and the outro music is by Hustlonia. The voices in the intro today were provided by Renee Colvert and Allegra Ringo, who are the hosts of a very delightful podcast about dogs called Can I Pet Your Dog? Check it out wherever you get your podcasts. If you love dogs, it is a great podcast for you. The episode art is by Matt Lubchansky. Please remember to take the survey. There's a link to it at the top of the show notes in your podcasting app. It's at flashforwardpod.com slash survey. And you can also find the link on Flash Forward's social media pages, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, all of that. Five people who fill out the survey will win goodie bags. They are really good goodie bags. There are pins and stickers and patches and all sorts of fun stuff in there. If you want to suggest a future we should take on, send us a note on Twitter, Facebook, or by email at info at flashforwardpod.com. I love hearing your ideas. Several listeners actually requested this episode. And if you think you've spotted one of the little references that I've hidden in this episode, email me there too. If you're right, I will send you something cool. And if you want to support the show, there are a few ways you can do that too. Head to flashforwardpod.com support for more about how to give. But if that is not in the cards for you, you can head to Apple Podcasts and leave us a nice review or just tell your friends about the show. That really, really helps. Okay, that's all for this future. Come back next time and we'll travel to a new one.